Go. My name is David Zucker. I'm the assistant to the moderator, Tim Walter. I'd like to welcome all of you to the weekly meeting of the College of Complex Playground for People Who Think. We have two policies here. One for the time. Yes, Charlie, that means you. And no personal attacks. Uh, our format is as follows. First of all, in a few moments, Charlie is going to, or Charlie Taylor, our coordinator, is going to announce the upcoming program. That time, we will then have uh, announcements of neighborhood or community interest. Those must be speakers, not announcements. Those must be announcements, not speakers. I will introduce tonight's speaker. We will talk about our the topic of the evening. Then we will have questions and answers. Again, this is like Jeopardy. Questions must be in that form. No speakers. Speakers come up during the next section. Of the world. I'm sorry, I can't really understand you. I think you're a bit quiet. I can't hear you either, David. I mean, uh, it's way too quiet, to be honest. Just kind of speak up a little bit, David. Tim Bolger, our moderator, is going to portion out into segments. Is your name David or Dappers? Your voice fades in and out. Hey, how's this? Hey, how's this? Better, I think. Hello. All right, we can get it now. Yeah, that's a lot better. All right. Okay. And a similar portion out the amount of time each, per each person uh, gets to speak. Uh, and you can talk about anything you want during the rebuttal. We prefer that you report the speaker. But you still have to need to talk about anything you want, and then the speaker will get the last word. Now, one more thing um, this restaurant is not in business for its health. If you want to continue to be here, it has to continue to make money. That means you might as well order dinner or something else, or something else to eat and drink, and a $3 tuition charge will be collected from each of you for this college made to pay its expenses. All right, there, Charlie. You can, you can queue it up for the uh, announcement of the upcoming program. All right, welcome everyone to meeting number 3,720 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. First of all, I'd like to remind everyone that we maintain two email groups, a Google group and a meetup group. The instructions for joining these takes less than a minute and can be found at the center top of our main website. So either one of them, only one or two emails per week, no traffic, uh, recommend that you subscribe to that, um, either one of those groups. Uh, secondly, I'd like to request that everyone in attendance personally at the restaurant Please be quiet during the presentation, at least, because our microphones do pick up uh, side conversations. So please uh, keep quiet, at least during the presentation. Also, if you are attending by Zoom, as I see a number of people are, please at this time put a red X over your microphone so as not to interrupt our speaker. Thank you for your cooperation in this regard. So although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On June the 17th, next week, our own college regular, Andy Anderson, will be talking about censored subjects. This is a very contemporary issue here, a contested issue, uh, political correctness and so forth. And guys like uh, guys running for president like Kennedy, who perhaps should be censored. Nevertheless, he's going to be talking about the subject of censored subjects. Uh, June the 24th, we're going to be joined by an academic, uh, Professor McPherson, uh, who will bring us up to date on such entities as, as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, how we are in the midst of an abrupt 
irreversible climate change? And how should we respond either as individuals or as a community? June the 24th. On July 1st, we're going to have two independent state programs. I will be the host of the first one. I have done some significant research and ascertained, everyone has seen these historical markers around the United States. I will give my recommendation of what I believe are the 10 most important of these in the nation that you should bring your family if you have one and children should know about them. So it's about the historic sites of the ad. Everyone will be given an opportunity to suggest one or more that they think are much better than mine, which I don't perceive how, but some of you would like to believe so, uh, that my list is not definitive. The second event regarding Independence Day is that none other than George Washington himself uh, will be here at the College of Complexes with whom we can converse uh, personally. I want to ask him about this cherry tree and thing. Did he really uh, tell his pop that he did it? All right, please put your red X, everyone out there. Uh, do it now if you haven't done so. Okay, so uh, Sasha, uh, so you have an announcement, your hand is up. Yes, I have a question. Um, Go ahead. Is, uh, is this meeting live streamed somewhere yeah, on YouTube? Well, well, what right now we're uh, it's going to be up on uh, YouTube after uh, after we uh, I'll probably put it up on YouTube tonight. It'll be the Zoom call, and it'll be uh, if you look on the home page or the College of Complex. We have a lecture library where these are posted. Yeah, and I'll show you exactly where it's at here. Well, in not yet. Oh. Let's get through this. I'm just going to show you right there where the camera's at. Click on that, and you'll see all of our past programs. We got them going back to 2010. All right. Thank you'll you very able, much. You'll be able to see it with no trouble. Thanks a lot for letting us know. Any uh, any other announcements? I'm not finished, Tim. Okay, finish then, Charlie. Please. On uh, July, okay. On uh, July the 8th, we are going to be visited by George Washington himself. Okay, should be an interesting evening. You can ask him about the Constitutional Convention and so forth. On July 15th, we're going to try something a little bit differently. I have a theatrical recording of a letter written by uh, uh, Frederick Douglass to his former slave owner on the 10th anniversary of his attaining freedom uh, by uh, purchasing his freedom and living up north. So we we're opening that up for discussion. I have a number of questions. I'll be directing and moderating a program that takes about 20 minutes only to listen to the letter that he wrote and his observation on the institution of slavery. On July 22nd, we just put this, Reverend Charlie Earp, Unitarian Universalist minister, uh, will be telling us why we yeah. should join and become members and support the candidate of the People's Party. Uh, looks like Cornell West is trying to secure their uh, their um, endorsement. So that's July 22. July 29th, uh, we haven't gotten a written description yet, a definitive one, but our own Jonathan, Jonathan Barton wants to return and do an evening uh, thus far, he's calling it, uh, the poetry of change. So mm -hmm. we'll see, uh, be confirmed upon receipt of a written description. Uh, transitioning into August the 5th, uh, Jian Lee, an academic from our other campus, will be looking over this artificial intelligence, which seems to be uh, uh, taken over our society to some extent, or some think it will. Nevertheless, artificial intelligence, she usually has detailed, well-researched programs. That leaves open 
three dates in August 12, 19, 26 are open. If you'd like to speak, please contact me. In terms of the announcement of an event around town on Wednesday at one o'clock, I haven't confirmed it, but there should be a meeting of the Illinois Advocates for the passage of HR 598, the Earth Bill to counter climate change. So if you'd like to get the Zoom link and so forth on that, please contact me personally. Thank you, Tim, take it away. Okay, we have a guest from Ukraine, Vladimir right, Sosarev. Right, you wanna say- Any more announcements of neighborhood or community interest? Are hearing none? All right, let's get going. Tim, all right, all right. I'd like to welcome Vladimir from Ukraine. Speaker tonight is Heinrich Kowalczyk. 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 Speaker tonight is
I I understand Russian, and then you know, what? Well, she's I mean, locked off. Hmm, it was not racial. She's locked. You off. said I was. You said in my country there are racist. Yeah, yeah, no, I did not. Uh, you call us fascists. What is wrong with you? No, no, no. I did not, bro. Get control of the meeting. All right, what do you want to just mute everybody? We want to hear the speaker. If you don't mind, there is a Russian racist here. Everyone, Sasha, um, we'll address that later, okay? Okay, thank you, because this is outrageous. All right, that's fine. Uh, Please do not interrupt this program. Okay. All right, uh, go ahead and uh, start let's, speaking, and I'll get okay. your PowerPoint. Go in my PowerPoint. Okay, we, we cannot up. talk about situation in Ukraine from the American perspective. For Americans, <laughs> today only counts. For Americans, history is those uh, those things which people remember when they were young. <laughs> For most of the world, it is different. For most of the world, whatever happens 800 years ago is as important as for most Americans eight days ago. And it is not something we, we should disrespect. This is what me it means that people understand the historical context and people understand that who they are didn't happen from nowhere. It comes from certain tradition. So we have to start with a certain history. Move to the next one. Slavs, which are Russian, Ukrainians, Poles, Czechs, Slovaks, <laughs> uh, Serbians, uh, Macedonians, all those but Bulgars on the south. Those are Slavian nations, and it is something very specific about that group of nations. They showed up, I'm showing the map of uh, Slavic tribes in the prehistoric times. And basically, what is when we look at the history of Europe, we have well documented history, let's say, of Roman Empire and whatever, and we see that somewhere about 2,000 years ago, there were some uh, Vandals, there were uh, Avars, there were uh, Huns who were uh, running and uh, conquering the Europe or whatever they could. Vikings were uh, the latest, the, the latest. Slap showed up quite. There is some not well confirmed history that Slavs showed up somewhere in today's eastern Ukraine area about 2,000 years ago. Nobody knows from where, because of the Slavic languages, very similar to Sankris, we can conclude that they came from India. And then they didn't conquer no one, but we noticed that somewhere about fifth century, in Byzantium, they talk about Slavs getting influence because suddenly nobody knows how and where Slavs were the, uh, farmers in the area of Yugoslavia and uh, Bulgaria. There was no conquering. Slavs come as one of the first successful farmers. Previous tribes were mostly those who were hunting, hunters, Slavs were the first who were introducing agriculture. This was a trade. So those Slavs, Slavs at the same time roughly start expanding day by day when my one man about the time and uh, mostly in today's area of Ukraine, which is very uh, good for agriculture, they settled somewhere by the that time, that end. At the same time, it looks like much a little later in today's Ukraine, they moved farther west, as Ukraine has very good agriculture area. Uh, today's Poland were mostly marshes. There were uh, forests, 
<laughs> at least on the northern part of it. So it took a little longer, but slabs also moved over there, ended up somewhere in the middle of today's Germany. And this was the area, those were marked here in those corridors where the areas with Slavic tribes were living somewhere by the, the uh, nine of the ninth century. Germans were removing from the West and between 900 and 1000, they basically conquered those uh, east, uh, Western Slavs. And they were the basic Poles who were the roughly at that area where today Poland exists. We have current maps of Europe overlaying that. And Poles become, you know, the nation trying to oppose the German expansion. They took Christianity from Rome, and uh, this is how Poland started forming. In the case of Russia and Ukraine, was a little different story. Vikings were a very, you know, uh, military strong organization, and they were, uh, you know, conquering whatever they could. They had a trade of the rivers from Scandinavia all the way to Byzantium. The Baltic tribe called Bargandians. They were the country controlling that. And somewhere around 800, yes. they established the trading point in today's Kiev. And this is how the history of Russia and Ukraine started. The first uh, ruler was the Rurik, which was Viking. And he established the principality in today's Kiev. But his children, grandchildren, got Slavized because the local people were the Slavs. And this is how the Rurik dynasty, which later spread ruled that area for a few hundred years. The, uh, I think it was great grand son of Rurik, who was so-called Vladimir the Great. He converted to Christianity in 1988. And at that time, he ruled a big part of that area. And for both nations, for Ukraine and for Russia, he is considered the founder of the country. What happened later, that after the death of Vladimir the Great, uh, as it often happened in those times, there were, uh, his sons, grandsons, cousins, or whatever, they created multiple principalities, and they fight with each other, they rule it. And we had some period, marking period in the history. Move it a little bit to the next one. It seems like a chance here. You know I, I know how to change. I know it's just the computer's a little low, okay. a little slow. Okay, there we go. What happened in the 13th century, beginning from about 1200, we have the Mongols expanding toward Europe. In and then they conquered most of those Russian principalities. And they went up to all the way, almost to the today's border between Poland and Ukraine and Belarus. They, in the country, they went all the way up to the west of today's Poland. Yeah. It's all right, well, well. What, what is the problem? Nothing, I think somebody just forgot to mute, that's all. Okay, and here by the west of, of Poland, in 1241 was the, one of the biggest battles, and that battle was the Polish lost, but Mongols couldn't hold their holdings, so they moved back, but within the next, 40 years or so, 
they gradually start losing their control of those Western principalities because Lithuanians, for reasons not known why, they get some power and they start moving to the next one. And they start conquering, yeah, and Lithuanians start conquering those Western Russian principalities. And they conquer what today is a little bit of west part of today's Russia, today's Belarus, and a big part of today's Ukraine. And this is what they control. Uh, they start controlling that about 1300, and they control that for quite a while. The reason what I am saying that is that we're talking about completely different cultures between that part and that part. Mongols were people at that time who were basically living out of looting whatever they can conquer. So when they went all the way there, they basically took whatever they could and they ran back. Here they were able to establish their presence and in those areas, which is most of today's European part of Russia, they were able to keep their holding for about 240 years from about circa 1240 to circa 480. Their rule was something unusual for the farmers as Slavs were. For the farmer, the big part of the farmer identity is feeling that they own the piece of land. That is my piece of land. And there's even the Polish saying that the man on his homestead is as a government. It was the the freedom of the individual to do whatever hell they wanted and build their uh, wealth by working that farm. For that reason, for the society to function, the whole political concept of all those club principalities was based on the concept of the respect for the private property and respect for the fruits of your neighbor's work. Whatever your neighbor was able to earn on his or her farm, it was hers, not yours. You couldn't touch it. This was the political concept which all those communities shared. In the case of Mongol, they were not farmers. They enslaved or control those farmers and their concept was that they feel they have a right because they subdue those principalities to come whatever they want and they have certain protocols for that and take whatever they wish so then simply that couple of soldiers from well back uh, east came to the community, they didn't care if you are the prince ruling the community or you are the farmer or you are the poor man. If they saw that you have something that you enrich yourself, they took it. If they like to take your wife, they took it. If they like to take your daughter, they took it. If you had a son and they told, they felt that that man can be trained as a soldier, they took it. So for those communities, for 240 years, the basic survivor was trying to avoid being collapsed and being collapsed from whatever they had was their understanding of the government and the power. And of course, under those conditions, your people live in the extreme power. At the time when Poland in the, let's say, uh, 14th century, become 
converted from the country which most houses uh, uh, and you know buildings were wood it becomes uh, okay. cities were built of mortar and brick up to about uh, 16th century there were practically no more i mean brick and mortar building in that eastern part of russian land they were so extremely poor and after about 480 russian finally overcome that mongol they call it tata yoke because uh, mongols later used the tatas from here to be they executed so there was uh, so after they overcome that uh, time of extreme exploitation they didn't know any other system of government and that kind of system and mentality of politics dominates that part of the world and this is what is the problem okay we can go further next slide yeah move me to the next slide yeah. there we go okay what's happening at the same time what happened when somewhere in that part between poland and lithuania there were the types called Prussians. they were the pagans and they were very aggressive so the Polish were fighting with them lithuanians and some stupid polish prince asked the autonomic knights who were free because they came from the crusaders and about uh, in uh, 1226, he gave them a little small piece of land and asked them to fight the Russians. Within about 50 years, they conquered all the Russians and they created a new country. They created the Teutonic Knights country, which soon took part of Poland and was fighting with Lithuania. By the end of the 14th century, something happened that we'll call it the event of the millennium. Oh, I've got the better part. Yeah, you got it now. Come on. Oh, bring it I would not need to yell as much. Okay. Thank you. And I'm going to put the, we'll get it all set. So go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So by the end of the 14th century, it just happened the old King Dial died, and he had a young daughter. The girl was about 14, apparently smart and beautiful. And uh, the Polish those rulers you know those seniors they tried to find out what to do and at that time we had a little bit of policy because i'm polish they had a little bit of issues with lithuania as well but certainly night was the biggest problem so they noticed that in vilnius there was lithuanian ruler called Jagiello, the guy was in you lithuanian who was about 40 at that time and he was one of the best sons of Lithuania. And they decided that they gave him the offer he put in the future. They gave him the Polish crown, the beautiful young queen, uh, the princess, and he took it. Lithuanians still have a little bit of problem with us, Poles, that they we, we, we did it. But what's happened, this created dynastic union between Poland and Lithuania which uh, gradually evolved and 200 years later, uh, 150 years later, right. 160. Stop. Can everybody still hear him pretty well? Yes. On the Zoom, can everybody hear him? Yes. Okay, thank you. Pretty well, yes. Thank you. So, uh, so basically that uh, dynastic union turned into the union between Poland and Lithuania. So suddenly, relatively small Poland become the very large country together and uh, created so-called Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. And one more time, uh, the political system was very unique, like for all European countries. Uh, there was basically democracy almost akin to that what we have in the United States. 
kings were uh, after a while, not at the beginning, but left uh, after a while, they were elected in similar manner like president of the United States. The, uh, if you read the book by uh, Norman Davies, who is a, a British historian, he wrote the best history of Poland. So when I read his book, I was the mostly shocked when he was, he couldn't believe it, that in Poland, the noble could tell the uh, king that I am, you are the first, what is going on here? What you doing here? I am not, that's somebody uh, green screening us. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt uh, the screen sharing. Okay. What, uh, what is going on? Okay, so uh, we got hot. Well, we got, yeah, we, we have somebody, uh, oh, somebody is trying to hack us. It's okay. So, uh, we'll get it fixed it's fine. So what's, what, so what's, what was, uh, uh, all nobles were considered equal to the king. King was considered the first among the equal. Uh, and one more time, that kind of tradition comes from the, uh, farmer's mentality that farmers is the ruler on his land and no one can take anything from him, even the king. So, so, so this is, okay. I'm just kidding. But... It's fine. So what I'm trying to stress, which is very important because that kind of system was common for the whole Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth and even more, as Poland become a little richer and dense with denser population, all that fell the wall system start kind of shaping up. So people were equal to each other, let's say in the beginning of 1200, 1300, the difference were in, let's say material status. Then by the 1500s, nobles who were the landowners practically start abusing the uh, servants who were working on the land who didn't own the land and gradually they become practically speaking uh, 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 slaves or there was not formally slaves but they had very little uh, uh, freedom and they couldn't at a certain point leave that landlord and so on. I'm talking about that because this is very essential to the history of the Ukraine. Because at that time when the Poland get control of the of the today's Ukraine, or most of it at least, Ukraine didn't have such a high density population and didn't have such a formal structure. So Ukraine was in the 15th century or 16th century was more like Poland a hundred years back, the more people consider them equal. Could you pause for just a second? Yes. My apologies, please. We're just trying to get this. Uh, okay. Well, I'm a little behind, but I'm okay. 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 What is just happening here? I stopped screen sharing for a minute that uh, I could get that whiteboard thing down. There's a guy uh, out. I'm just not sure exactly what to do. We'll get it. Well, that, that's okay. It, we understand that uh, we're, going, uh, we're going back to uh, machine scars. Subject is hot. So some people are losing losing their nerves. Well, we're going to go right back to uh, Facebook. Sorry about this. We're back with your PowerPoint. Okay. And we're sorry about the delay. Okay. So what I'm trying to say that gradually that part of Ukraine as being part of Poland start becoming more like Poland. What's happened, however, that the nobles on that part of which Poland united with both, uh, I mean, Lithuanians, Belarusians, and Ukrainians they become Polonized because the, the king was Polish. The language between Belarusian and Ukrainians are very similar. I mean, 
even right now the vocabulary is almost 60 percent the same words uh, but at that time the close the proximity of those languages was so there was no big process but what's happened then gradually that when those enriched ukrainian landlords as well as some poles who moved over there Okay, that's fine. That's okay. Well, let's let's. I just wish they would not use the whiteboard. I'm trying to be. It's okay. They cannot win it that way. They cannot win it other way. Uh, let's move on. Okay. I don't worry about it. All right. So what I'm trying to say that somewhere about 16th century, there becomes some conflict between Poles and Ukrainians because the free-minded Ukrainians were uh, gradually uh, the, the landlords that moved them, at least the masses, into Sabdu serfs in the feudal system. So on the top of that, that Ukrainians had different language, different uh, alphabet, and they also have different religion, then they start losing the freedom so there was a lot of tension which Poles uh, didn't recognize in the right way. And as a matter of fact, there's a different story, Poland lost independence because of the, that, that they didn't realize that at certain point, the wealth comes not only from land, but also from industry. But this is a different, different part. So what I'm trying to say that in 1648, become a revolt, by uh, led by Bogdan Khmelnytsky, who was one of the Cossack, like they call those Ukrainian Ottoman uh, Ukrainian leaders. And he tried to create the independent Ukraine from that part. Those were not the times good for Ukraine and for those ideas. They had Tatars and Turks from that side. Russia become already strong on that side. So they lost uh, the fight in the fight with Poles. And then they decided, and Russia at the time become a little bit powerful and they tried to get that territory and they messed around. So they convinced Kalmitsky that he can get protection from Russian Tsar in order to uh, get free from Poland. What he didn't realize, because he took it, and then in uh, 1654, they call it so call it Pyroslav Agreement. But just forget about it. Let's let's go on. Uh, 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 he signed the Pyroslav Agreement, seeking protection of uh, uh, Russian Tsar for the part of Ukraine which he was controlling. He got it, and then the first meeting when he had with uh, Russian Tsar representatives, he was thinking that he is getting similar kind of autonomy and recognition of his freedoms like he was get used to get from Poles. And they told him, no, the Tsar is absolute ruler, and you have no, nothing to say. You have to follow what we tell you. It was a little bit too late. The part of that Ukraine, that part of Ukraine become the part of Russia. And as Poland, you can move the map to the next one. As then Poland got weakening, Poland basically by the end of the 19... All right, okay, so this is one of the map. Move one more. Okay. So by the end of the 19, of the 18th century, in uh, formally in 1795, Poland was taken apart, and it by uh, 1815 there were some different moves. Uh, that part of Poland, today Central Poland, all the part of Ukraine, Belarus, also Lithuania, uh, Estonia, whatever, all that become the part of Russia. What is important that small part of Ukraine, Lemberg, this is the German name for Lviv, and that area 
that become the part of Austrian Empire. In Austrian Empire, they had a lot of more tolerance and support for uh, minorities. So, yes. That is, forget about it. Okay, so this this fine. I think it's just disrespectful. It's good. Tim, Tim, don't do, those Tim, don't ideas. worry about. Let's they, they talk. Don't know. worry about the side stuff. Yeah, let's go. Let's right, keep sorry, keep going. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, right yeah. Let's keep keep going because you know we are moving to the interesting stuff. Okay. Go to. Yeah, there is, go, I think this one, no, one more, one more, one more, one more. No, okay. Yeah, okay. So, so in uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, they had a lot of respect for minorities. They were a part of the politics, but of course they also didn't want uh, those minorities to get too much power. So when it comes to that part, as this were about, uh, I don't want to guess it right now, but I think half half Ukrainians, Poles, and also many Jews. So uh, they played those uh, ethnic interests. So when they want to uh, hurt a little bit of Polish influence, they help Ukrainians, they, they want to help Ukrainians, they hurt Poles. Basically, they didn't want any of those groups get too much influence. But what it means that for Ukrainians, this was the only small piece of Ukraine when they had a little bit of freedom to maintain, cultivate their culture and bring their national identity to the modern terms. We have to realize that up to the age of common education, when the books become common. The national identities were not recognized the way we see them now. There was a 19th century where suddenly people realize that because they speak certain language, they pray in certain language, they, home, they talk in their home, in their villages in certain languages, they create certain community which is bigger than their family, their village. They are a nation. And this was the, that period of the national awareness. And those Ukrainians in that part, they did tremendous work to cultivate national identity. There were many, they tried to get some influence on the uh, Ukrainian uh, territories, which were under Russian controls, which were uh, uh, most Ukrainian leave. But what was going on that uh, over there in Russia, they uh, did a lot of work. I mean, work. They sent people to Siberia and things like that. So it's not that they tried to uh, minimize the development of Ukrainian language. They tried to say, "What well, this is almost the same language, Russian, the, with the same religion. The, but we are the same. Just you know, the folks talk Ukrainian. Regular people talk Russian. Okay, and this was basically the policy." Of, of that of that of that part uh, of Russia uh, toward the Ukrainians with the occupy just forget about it boot the guy out who's us no no let's him listen to it okay we, we don't so when the let's keep going when uh, 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 during the after the World War one there was when there was all the tumult in U Europe, when the Poland get independence, the Czech get independence. Uh, so there was also the short leave Ukrainian Republic, with Ukraine moved to the next one, which U Ukrainian tried to create their own. Uh, this one. Just, just move it one, okay? Okay, so this is what we have 
is very interesting. I put the the common the, the lines show the current borders, and that shows how borders shade up after the uh, World War One. So that part of the today's with former Soviet Union, that part was the part of Poland. This was the part of Moldavia. Uh, and that part of Belarus was a part of Poland. So it means that on that part of the eastern part of Poland, there were um, uh, huge Ukrainian minorities. And of course, there were a lot of tension because there were the different schools in the Polish politics. Some Polish politicians, they tried to revive the old Polish Lithuanian commonwealth in the same country like it existed between 1795. And they believed that in order to have it working, Poles should support Ukrainian culture and uh, Belarusian culture. So they will fill the part of the new bigger uh, Polish commonwealth. And some other people, Poles, they believe that simply they need to be Polonized. So there were a lot of friction and there was not unite policy. And generally speaking, Ukrainians uh, felt that they didn't have the fair treatment. So when the war started, uh, we're talking about World War II. Okay, let's me uh, move one more thing which we have to say. Uh, no, no, okay. No, 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 go, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. Yeah, okay, this is with okay. Wait. What we have to also say that during the Soviet times, one more time, the Ukrainian culture was, let's say, cultured in the reserve manner. But one thing which is important needs to be mentioned here is the Holodomor from uh, 1932 1934. As I said, Slavs and those Slavs like Poles, Ukrainians, they value greatly their farms. There was sacrum because this is what they, was their livelihood. When the Soviet Union took over, they decided that in order to uh, poor people around the country, all the capitalists needs to be eliminated. For them, they call them kulaks, the farmers who are having the small piece of land and they were managing that. And they decided they have to give up their farms and then uh, uh, be taken by big cohorts. So those are basically collective uh, you know, organizations running that. Of course, they were resisting that. So Russian, Kremlin, Russian, Soviet rules, which were run mostly by Russians, they created the, the, the rules that if you resist, you are basically a traitor. And that basically they killed many people because they want to uh, uh, resist. They created the rules that the uh, farmers need to give all whatever they produce for some you know, petty payments to the government. If they went to your farm and they found the cow, which you didn't report, they found the bag of, of uh, grain, which you didn't give or whatever, they basically uh, considered you were considered the traitor and quite often you were killed on the spot. This created uh, such a damage that the, basically the basket, the food basket of Europe, the place which is known to be able to create right now, it creates uh, most of the grain which goes to Africa or to Asia, or whatever. They basically destroyed agriculture completely. Five million people in Soviet Union because of that died of starvation. Roughly, this is what the statistics say. But out of those five millions, four of them were in. Soviet Ukraine. At that time, there was about one eighth of the population. So they died of starvation because, and this is somebody put that, 
shackle it, uh, 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 sickle and hammer, just to say that this is the, those are the people who did it. And then what's happened, of course, after they finally won, they needed people to work the land and to work in the industry. So they bring, brought the Russians from the native Russian lands to settle that land. So right now, when we're talking about a big Russian minority, there are the reasons for that. Not only that many people get Russified, uh, Russified but also many simply were abroad because Ukrainians in big masses were killed. So uh, in those, in the contents, we uh, shouldn't worry, we means we shouldn't be wondering that during the World War II, many Ukrainians were sympathizing with Germany because they saw that as a uh, power which could destroy the Soviet Union and then uh, uh, help uh, start uh, establishing the uh, 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 independent Ukrainian country. Of course, there was a bad choice, but to be honest, in these situations, they didn't have good choices. Whatever they chose wasn't good. So for that reason, uh, today, some people say that we have that, you know, in Ukraine, there's the tradition of Nazis and whatsoever. Yes, there were some people who aligned with it. As a matter of fact, as a poll, I can say that when there was a war, and when it becomes obvious in 42, 43, that most likely the Germans will lose and the Soviet Union will take over, some Nazis from the Ukrainian extreme forces, they were trying to expel Poles who were living at those areas in which were the part of Poland before the World War II. And officially they tried to basically push them to move. And officially, I and mean, what was happened, about 200,000 Poles were killed who lived in those area, in the areas in the uh, years, mostly 43, uh, uh, and mostly those were the women, children, and old people because men were already somewhere in the war. So there is a lot of blood which Ukrainians harm uh, to Poles. Uh, and unfortunately, after the war, Poland is here, Ukraine is here, and we still have to live together and find some peace with it. Okay, so uh, this what's happened. It's very interesting also, we don't see Crimea, it's a little bit farther there. C Crimea was, uh, 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 there were some Russians, Ukrainian, but most of uh, people living there were the Ukrainian Tatars, I mean, so, sorry, uh, Crimean Tatars, local people who lived over there for millennials. They also saw some chance that Germany if they conquer uh, the Soviet Union, that they can give Tatars better treatment. So some of them also sympathize and hope Germans. And when it comes to Tatars, Stalin did something which he couldn't do to the Ukrainians. Basically, he decided that in order to resolve the problem, after the war, he made an order and all Tatars living in Crimea were expelled, moved all the way to Siberia. You know. So uh, simply there were uh, no Tatars, at least those which they could identify as Tatars expelled from Crimea. And whom they send over the Russians. So right now when Russian claim that there is a big, big uh, and to be, to be honest, uh, they did it in, in 1944, it, I think it was 80s, and of course later 90s when the Soviet Union collapsed. In 80s, Soviet Union uh, allowed some of those Tatars who moved over there to move back, and some did. But they are right now a minority in Crimea, Russia is a majority. So when Russia right now claims that they have a title to, uh, to, to Crimea because they have a Russian majority over there, 
Nobody is talking about how it happened. Okay, we have to know it. Okay, let's go. Okay, well, we can keep that map. Uh, under the Soviet rule, comparing to other places, Ukraine wasn't the best, the worst place. It is, after all, on the track, uh, trade tax, it has uh, the great uh, agriculture. And then on the east side of Ukraine, in today's uh, Donbass area, what we call it, they have coal, they have uh, uh, iron ore and a lot of other minerals. So they have big industrial complex, metallurgy industry uh, uh, in the eastern Ukraine. And then uh, Ukraine was well industrialized for, as, as so there was a big economic part of the former Soviet Union. So that Ukrainians, I mean, people living in Ukraine, Ukrainians, uh, Russians, there were many Jews, they were uh, comparably to, let's say, other parts of the Soviet Union, they were uh, doing probably better than most. And then we can move further there. No, this is not what I want to see. Go next one. Oh, shit. Okay. No, no, I know. I, I screwed it up. Okay, so this is what, uh, this is what, sorry. Sorry, what something I, I didn't realize. I screwed up something. So then we have to talk a little bit about Ukraine after, and I had nice charts and somehow I think I forgot to put them in. Ukraine after 1991. What's happened? Uh, the fall of the Soviet Union was a gift to Ukraine. There was no, there were no political movement in the Ukraine and anywhere in the, in the Soviet Union to weaken that. The only movement which was, it was in Poland, and you know, there's a lot, like I said, long tradition, blah, blah, blah. I was the part of it, so we can talk at length uh, uh, what we did, how we did it, that eventually Soviet Union tripped over that. They were due to fall on the own devices. But the fact that they, it happened when it happened was because of what was happening in Poland. It's just, I was there. And so what happened? No, that's fine. No, there, there is nothing right now. I, 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 we'll talk about that a little later, that's fine. So what's, what's happened that when Poland got free from the Soviet influence, it was better prepared because we had relatively vibe private sector. There were a little better traditions of respecting of freedoms. There was slightly less corruption than in the Soviet system. So despite that the Poland was corrupted and was basically broken at the time, Poland quickly start gaining economic strength. The charts which I apologize, I somehow missed to put that in the, there was a chart showing how fast that proving that in 1990, when the charges changed, changes changed, economy of Poland was roughly on the same level like economy of Ukraine. When it comes to the uh, GDP, I mean, the gross domestic product per person. In Poland, it started growing fast and Polish economy grew up a few times over. Ukrainian barely moved. When you look to the, how Poland was handling during those uh, 30 years, uh, how Poland was handling all those crises which we all ex experienced. So in Poland, when there was crisis 2008, the economy slightly dived and was going up. In Ukrainian, there was so otherwise, Ukraine was uh, less prepared. 
And of course, why may I ask, what's, what's happened, okay? Why, why Ukrainian didn't fare as well as Polish did, as Poland did? And of course, corruptions come as the first aspect. But then you have to ask, corruption, it means someone needs to give money to corrupt someone. And when you talk with Ukrainians, they will tell you that the biggest corruptor was Russia. They simply, the same way like they destroyed Poland in 18th century, by the end of 18th century, in our Poland, when there were any official government settings, the ambassador of Russia sat in the, in the corner and he was giving orders because he paid every all those Polish landlords and, and influential people who simply had the voice. And when somebody is wanna give money, they always somebody will take it. And when you have weak democracy, it simply takes over. So the same way you, uh, Russia was uh, destroying the democratic structures of Ukraine by corrupting people. And it took Ukraine about 20, 25 years. They, they started realizing what is going on when the new generation started popping out in about 2010, they said, well, we have to do something about it. And you have to also see that uh, I had also the chart showing, showing that in after the Ukraine and get independence, there was a huge, uh, emigration from Ukraine, people left out uh, to work out, outside because Ukraine was so disorganized and poor. And where did they go? Most of them went to Poland. Proximity, the same culture, the same language, almost similar language. And uh, most of all, uh, among the European countries, Poland was the only one who welcomed Ukrainian workers. Why? Because in 2005, Poland joined the European Union. And at that time, Poles got the right to work uh, in the West. Great Britain, about 1 million went to Great Britain and then to other countries. What's happened, those people who went to work over there, those were not people who were unemployed in Poland. Those were the qualified workers who simply figured it out that were by working on similar and sometimes even uh, less important jobs abroad, they can make triple whatever they were making in Poland at that time. So Poland was experiencing the huge short shortage of qualified workers and Ukrainians felt that. But those Ukrainians who came, they look around and they see, why we cannot do it in our place. We are smart enough to build the world of Poland. We can work in the modern country and grow and they could see how things are getting better. But they, so they ask why we cannot get it in our country. So that brought us to that orange revolution or whatever they called it in 2000. No, there was before that 2013. It was, but basically there were a few movements when they tried to get away from Russia. And every time when the movement was, the Russia was stepping in. And the critical moment was in 2013, when the Ukraine uh, was just about to sign the agreement with the European Union that they will get associated, they will have closer tie, economical ties with the European Union. So they hoped that they can get some of those benefits, which helped Poland to get over the uh, corruption in whatever. And let's make a small degradation. When Poland was joining European Union, what's happened that suddenly few politicians committed suicide. There were a few spectacular uh, homicides because suddenly 
when starting adopting the European standards, the corruption on the top levels starts showing up. And after that period, the corruption probably is still there, but probably is not much more than everywhere, like here and everywhere, because corruption always is. The question is whether this dominates the economy and politics. So uh, Ukrainians hoped that if they will sign some as association with the European Union, they will get to the same path. However, what stopped it, Putin said, no, this will be not good for Russia. This is the, we consider that not good for the Russian interest. And then at this time, we have to go back to that understanding of the difference between polit political culture, which Ukrainians and Poles ex uh, experienced for millennia, millennium, and that Mongol uh, extortion culture, which Russia still continues. They basically believe, and this is what uh, is hard to understand for American people, because they say, well, this is the sphere of influence. America has the sphere of influence in Latin America. Yes, it does. And it is true that those big American corporations, rich people, they go to those Latin countries, they corrupt them, and they basically run them, and they're basically unjust happening. But the point is that this is not but because there's the law that allows them to do it. It is because they abuse the freedom of trade to gain the political power. And it doesn't happen everywhere. When we look at Norway, which is a poor country and was poor country, let's say, and become rich before they found oil. Why they become rich? They have nothing. They have barely any arrow land. They have no minerals. They have those fishes which they can catch. They're all what they have. But they had moral politics. They have uh, uh, Christian traditions. And they were too poor, let's say, to lead the technological process, progress. It takes economical superpowers to create inventions like, let's say, uh, steam power. They, it takes certain potential to create the, uh, 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 all those industries. Great Britain could do it, Germany could do it, Netherlands could do it, France could do it, United States could do it. But what's happened? Norway, uh, Norwegian people were the, the first always implementing those technologies. And then by that, they didn't get corrupted by dealing with the superpowers. They didn't get corrupted by dealing with more powerful. They simply use that to their advantage. Ireland did the same in on our eyes within the last about 30, 40 years. It was one of the poorest countries in Europe. Right now, it is one of the richest. So what I'm trying to say that the difference between swirl of influence in the Western system is that we have certain concept of moral rules of interaction between people and nations. We have a legal system which supports that. Is that legal system always working and, and executed as it should? No. The same way like we have a law that stealing and killing is forbidden and still people do it. But what the Russians ask that because we have imperfection and we have people who are not moral in our sphere of influence, that they should have a right to go and grab whatever they want from people they consider being in their sphere of influence. And this is the difference that very few people understand. So people ask sometimes, we, is it that war between Ukraine and Russia proxy between the war between Russia and West and the, and the United States? 
And the answer is, it is to the degree that is that this is the war between the civilized world against the last openly barbarian empire. What I said before, uh, we were talking about it, that uh, we have that tradition of rule of law, respecting that uh, private people's rights, which was the part of the tradition of the farmer communities. Uh, oh my goodness, I lost the train of thought. So, uh, Law yes, no, I know. So uh, what we have to recognize that also in the Western world, we had many traditions which were the barbarians because Vikings were barbarians, okay? Germans also had that trait. And as a matter of fact, the last German attempt to do what Russia is trying to do right now was the World War II when they decided that we have more guns, we have stronger uh, tanks, we have whatever, and we'll take whatever we believe we deserve. Japanese people had the same culture. It, not all Japan was like that, but there was that straight that decided, uh, that, that, that brought them to, to try to counter, conquer uh, China and the big piece of, of Asia. And what we did as a Western culture, we basically told, no, we cannot tolerate in the current world the policy, the mentality that you believe that because you have stronger guns, you can go to your neighbors and take whatever you want. Because if we're gonna do it, we basically have the law of jungle. You cannot be, uh, save your, your day on your property and nobody else can. And as a part of that, and this right now, you can go to that Kellogg. As a part of that uh, strain of thought. Back, back to the screen now. Yeah, yeah that, that, that last. Okay. As a part of that, of that uh, uh, line of thought in 1928, after the 10 years after the World War I, politicians said, we have to do something. So it never again, things like that gonna happen. It's okay, I'll just look at this one, okay? And they met in Paris. There were the two fellows, I even don't know where they're from, I have to check it. And they signed and Soviet Union signed it and most of the uh, important worldwide countries signed it. There was a pact, which basically the most critical phrase of that pact is that all international disagreement should be resolved by pacific means. And in today's world, if we want to survive, there's only one way that we can do it. And the third part of that is, many people will know about that act, is because it didn't have the truth behind it. So basically it was the declaration of goodwill and understanding. The most important legal consequence of that act was the Nuremberg trials. Because after the World War II, they tried to find, is it the legal grant that we can put the former rulers of Germany on trial for their crimes. And they took that act and this was the legal grant for Nuremberg, Nuremberg trials. And then when we talk about today's war and many other words, when you listen to the media, and I'm, I'm finishing it. So there's a lot of talk about war crimes. War, we have Geneva Convention, which has a long list of things what are, should be illegal in war. But what is the more important, 
and which is no law for that. And it would have written that the starting the war, selecting the war, the invasion, regardless if you believe, if your reasons are real or perceived, starting the war in the crime, in the sense of that act. Okay? So, what we have to see that that if the war doesn't start there's no need to talk about the, the war crime and then this is something which we have to basically maybe end uh, because simply what we right now are fighting we are fighting trying to reach the same result like europe and world got in 1945 that the superpower or somebody pretending to be superpower was put to the ground and was basically forced to give up its imperial ambitions executed by force. And unfortunately, we hoped in 1990, when the Soviet Union fell, that Russia would join the worldwide community and will become one of those recognizing the same standard. And then let me finish with one more thought, which is related to the subject, because you find many wise people or pretending to be wise, they say, well, the world wouldn't start if West didn't expand the uh, NATO to the Eastern Europe, Russia felt treated. The point is that I remember, because I'm old enough, when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was discussion whether do we really need to keep NATO going. And I was also among those who said, maybe we don't need it. But then when I listened, at that time I was already here, when I listened what I heard from Poland, I said, the guys are right. Because they said, we know Russia. And we are afraid that will not take long. They have diamonds, they have gold, they have oil, they have gas, they will have tanks. And they have already, you know, uh, nuclear weapons. So we don't have any guarantee that if they change their mind five, 10 years from now, we will be in the square one. So that strong, and they were mostly Poles, but Baltic stayed with us uh, and most of the former Soviet countries in Europe. So we can speculate that let's say that the concept of canceling NATO would, pre would prevail. The next day, those countries who were formerly the part of the Soviet bloc would create some kind of and a military alliance and it wouldn't take long, Germany, France uh, would join because they would need to, okay? So we'll have NATO too. And the point is that presence of NATO, in, like let's say in Poland was very symbolic for the first 10 years or so of Poland being part of NATO. It become more real when the more real become that the Russia is going back on the on the other track. So simply, uh, this is something which we have to you know accept. And there is one thing which we add to, to, to close. When Ukrainians were looking that Poland was able to grow up economically much better than others, they thought that they can sneak into the European Union in 2013. And they got called awakening because Russia said no. And if they tried, Russia started meddling with them, took the Crimea uh, and started getting them troubles. What is the only difference between Poland and Russia uh, and Ukraine? It is uh, Article 5 of NATO. Poland had it, Ukraine did it. Thank you. Stay up there because we're going to have questions, times now. And uh, 
I love doing it. Just, you can you sit down if you want. You can no, sit down if you want. I'm young. I can sit. Okay, well, I'm just simply saying. I, I apologize. I apply to finish it fast. <laughs> Go ahead, Ernie. We'll, uh, we'll uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Ernie. Kim, no. can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Good. All right. Um, my, I, I, very good talk. Very, enjoyed it very much and would like to hear more. And I'm going to finish reading your articles when I get a chance. I've only read some of them. Uh, but my question regarding your talk is that you did not mention the uh, Budapest Memorandum at all, having to do with nuclear weapons in 1994. Do you think this is not important or or how is that how would that have helped if 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 in fact we honored the United States and the other countries honored the Budapest memorandum uh might that have prevented the war I agree with you completely I had it on my list I overlooked it and you are right okay. so for those people who don't know uh, in 1991, when Ukraine was established, uh, they were in physical possession, uh, don't hold me right now, there was 2,000 something of nuclear weapons. However, all of them were controlled from Moscow. So there was the discussion, should Ukraine become the independent nuclear, nuclear power? Because they had also the means to manufacture the nuclear fuel. Or should they, should they give up? And as there was new country with a kind of a little shaky government, all wise people said, let's take that from them. They convinced Ukraine to give it to, uh, to Russia. And President Clinton uh, recently acknowledged that he helped that to happen. And he right now uh, believes that was a mistake. Okay, now I'm going to ask you this. Now, okay, fine. Answers, uh, 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 Yes. Yeah, you were talking about the Kulaks. And the Kulaks wouldn't give any of their grain or what they had to the, to the country as a whole. That's why, they, that's why Stalin went after it. So let me ask you, if the farmer creates the meat or, or grain and he doesn't give it to the whatever want to buy it, how he gets money? No, that's part of the, uh, like here, we like have here, people have to people have to work. No, it was, no. my question is what I said. I, I think you got that wrong. Well, no, that was very simple. The government wants to take their farms and want to take no, their... They, the they want them to contribute to the country. Like taxes, they want them to contribute. Yeah. They want Everybody has to give something. Okay. Let's move on. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Yeah, I just want to try to. I, I just want to try to answer a previous question uh, about the Budapest Accords. I think that's not quite accurate. The Budapest Accords came down in in 1994. And what it was actually Bill Clinton, I, I don't know Bill Clinton's idea, but he was pushing it. Uh, I saw him talk about it in an interview. The Budapest Accord says that, that the Ukraine. I just muted you, Jake, because this is rebuttal. This is, not, this is, this is rebuttal. question time. You can get this in the rebuttal time. All right. Uh, got a Hello? Yeah, Jake. Hello? What? Wait, I'm I'm confused now. You want me to talk now or no? We just cut you off because it was Do you want me to do you want me to go or no? Hello? Just wait a second. Well,
Um, could you speak up a bit? I mean, it's it's I mean, it's so quiet. I'm glad my friend Ernie brought up the first Budapest mem memorandum. Uh, I don't know why Clinton has been so uh, silent about that. You say he's recognized that uh, now. Uh, I would like to know from you if you think if Biden and the news media mentioned that Budapest memorandum frequently, that there would be less of this nonsense about that we shouldn't support Ukraine. Well, I, I can tell you one thing that uh, when the, I wrote in my writing, I wrote the article which I elaborated on uh, Budapest Memorandum in 2014, claiming that simply the obligation which USA took that will protect integrity of Ukraine in exchange for the giving up nuclear war, wars, nuclear power being the weapons that the USA simply didn't fulfill. And at that time, people were saying, well, there was not formal contract. Bullshit. It was on the paper signed by, by, by USA. And uh, for the first two months when the war started and before the war, nobody was mentioning Budapest Memorandum anywhere in the major stream media. I wrote a few articles when I wrote about it, and then gradually it started popping up. But you are correct. They don't talk about it enough. Okay, Charlie, you're next online. Go ahead. Yes, I don't know if this is relevant, but I read an interesting thing that Russia sent in soldiers who were in uniform without insignia uh, into Crimea and possibly the Ukraine to influence local politics. They're called little green men even. It's just, I, I'm not aware of any situation in which Soldiers are sent into a country in such a fashion. Is there any validity to the, was the scheming by Russia? Uh, they were sending military in, although they were not identified as soldiers. Thank you. I don't understand the question. All right, that's good enough. All right, uh, who's next? We got Jonathan. Jonathan, all right. On August 6, 1945, in Hiroshima, the United States dropped a bomb that killed 140,000 civilian casualties. On August 9, 1945, the United States dropped a bomb on Nagasaki that killed 74,000 civilian casualties. As has been reported in several news outlets, there was a peace pact last year that the United States government moved heaven and earth to prevent. Do you think the United States government with our history, and I have all the countries listed here if you need some suggestions to assist your memory, is an honest broker for peace in 2023 on planet earth between any nations? Let me be honest with you. Nobody is saint, and the United States is not saint either. Okay, what there, there, there is one more time. There is a big difference between having the rules and the laws, means moral rules and standards, and the laws supporting them. And let's say one of the biggest example that those rules and laws were stretched. I think beyond what they should was the invasion in Iraq, okay? However, simply, at least they covered the grants. They tried to make it legal. They built a coalition, blah, blah, blah. There was something which we can question on moral grants. Legally, it will be hard. So what I'm trying to say, there's no perfection. You want perfection, go to heaven. But there's that small problem, you have to die first. Can I have a follow-up question? Yeah, go ahead, see it's worth a nuclear war. What? What did you say? He said war. What about nuclear war? I have a question. Um, okay, okay. Yeah. I, you, it's okay, go ahead. It, I appreciated your talk, the history, the context, but it did seem to be stacked. Terry, are you alive? Yeah, we're alive. It seemed to be stacked towards you know, Ukraine good, Russia bad. And 
there's two versions of history and some of them are there's Nazis in Russia and in Ukraine. And, you know, and as a consumer, you hear things about Russia that that they're really the Nazis. And, uh, you know, it's and what about, you know, why foreign entanglements, but NATO, Gladio, terrorism, keeping synarchism, both sides of the war, that benefits the arms industry. I mean, why can't we just give peace a chance? You are you're bringing, very valid, you're bringing very valid point because I brought the different traditions, but then in my closing, I mentioned Germany and the same kind of barbarian thinking was the big stake in the German political thinking. And this uh, led, you're right, Carrie. And it led to the World War II and the all atrocities. And what I'm trying to say that the world stood against it. But we didn't say the Germans are bad. We simply brought them to the point that we told them, if you want to be a member of the community, this is not the way we will tolerate. And ask Germans, do they complain? The same we have to do with Russia. And Russia is a rich country. They're full of great people and simply they have to give up the concept that they can extort from you and me what they didn't earn. That all. The U.S. extorting from the Ukraine. Okay. HR smoking kills. So that we, can sell more we don't know that. Uh, the, the, no, you, you miss. Okay, one more time. Make Germany great again. Adolf, could you help us? You want to ask a question, James? Uh, what did you say, James? I think Adolf could help us make Germany great again. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I'm half German and half Russian, but uh, I don't know how to answer your question, bro. I'm going to give each of you guys about Are three minutes. Him? To do no, no, no. Uh, I'm German. But, but, and, okay, the uh, next section of this meeting. Russian. The next section oh. of this meeting. Now, He's just but, uh, you don't what's up it. with James? I don't know. Keeping uh, with the tradition what, what's your question, the, uh, bro? Gentlemen, gentlemen, please give me your attention. I mean, hey, what All was right, your question, James? Uh, can you answer me? For order from Adolf, please, shut up. Because now we're going no, to go who into said our... This? All right, guys, on the, in the background on the computer, we'll be able to get to this because... Now, this is something unique in most meetings. For those of you guys who don't know about our format, we do have a speaker, a question and answer. And now we're going to each, I'm going to give you each about three minutes uninterrupted to give you your point of view. Well, because I'm sure we're going to have a lot of people in here and I'm going to strongly enforce it. But what we're going to do is think my first reaction and the way I feel about Ukraine is exactly right. Russia would have been better off cooperating with America by building something called the Bering Strait Bridge. And what it is, is it's within engineering context, it would open up Siberia, Russia would get the rule of law in there and get their things going. We could probably start shipping goods from China. And when we're trading, we're not fighting. And I'm just gonna simply say this, if Vladimir Putin really wants to get his country, turn the guns off, get Gazprom opened up, and build the Bering Strait Bridge because that That's will be a lot heard. better. All right, I've had my say. Who's got the next rebuttal? Uh, I think right, James Sidler. wanted to say something. All right, hey, uh, Dolph, it's all... all right, we're gonna go with you, John. Uh, Tim, if anybody interrupts without being recognized, kindly zap them. That's the rule. All if right, you go could you morning. repeat that? Sorry, uh, That's I, I the could rule. Hear. You are yes. right, Tim. Get rid of them. All okay. Right. Goodbye. Adolf. Uh, Goodbye. Charlie. Okay. Now we're going to go with Jonathan next. And then we're going to go with Jake, who's got his hand up. And if you want to uh, uh, speak, uh, do the rebuttal, either let me know through the chance, chat or through raising your hand. I will go from there. Sit down and. No, no, I click to see who is on there. Yeah, no, that, that's Jonathan right now. We'll, we'll get him up there. The other people are here. They're uh, 
got it. David Steele. They're, 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 some of them are, are not showing their video right now. Some are. Okay. I mean, the... sorry if, uh, to interrupt, but I, uh, I'm really not trying to troll. I mean, I, I've been chatting like the whole time because. Yeah, I know. Uh, I, I know, know right off. Tell, um, tell we'll them to go. Okay, Adolf, what we'll do is we, uh, raise your hand, Adolf, if you want to speak. All right, Adolf, I'm going to let you go and give you three minutes after we do Jonathan, then we do Jake, and then I'll let you go and you'll give it, get a chance to rebut, okay? And I know you've been going back and forth in the chat, so, and I understand where you're coming from. It's a new format for you. Okay, so, uh, Jonathan, you got three minutes. Go ahead. We love you, but you're not the microphone. So sorry if you can't hear me. I don't care about the microphone. Jonathan, well, you can hear me, right? Can everybody hear me? Uh, Jonathan, let's go. Okay. Gonna... No, we cannot hear you. Please comply with the rules for using no the interrupting. Or sit down. And Adolf, goodbye. Okay. We don't need you. You have not been recognized yet. Just because I'm Russian, bro. I don't care what you are. I don't care if you're a Martian. Bro, what the fuck, man? Bro, look at you. What the fuck? Greatest bloodless revolution in history to remove that Soviet regime. And Russia's democracy, with respect to our speaker, I'm glad you're here. I love the fact that no one can hear me. Is it as far advanced, if not farther, than any of these countries we've just signed up to defend from Russia? Of course, there is going to be bad reaction from Russia. And then the NATO expanders will say, that we always told you that is how Russians are, but this is just wrong. That's by George Kennan, a political scientist, U.S. diplomat, writer, historian, foreign policy strategist, and the architect of the U.S. policy of containment. Jonathan, speak into the microphone, please. Expansion during the Cold War. So uh, here's something else someone said. Uh, his name is Wayne... Morse from Oregon. We're very proud people, and it's good that we're proud, but we can't run away from the facts just because we may have a false sense of pride and difficulty with our foreign policy. And that is that we have been the outlaw, we have been the aggressor. We violated one section after another of the Charter of the United Nations. We practically tore up the Geneva Accords. We have to face up to the fact that we cannot conduct a unilateral military course of action around the world without the world America against us. We've got to get out. So uh, with that in mind, I went to World Beyond War uh, website this week to do some research. I appreciate the speaker talking about very difficult subjects in a short amount of time. I wish he had an extra hour. Why is he refusing to use a microphone? So what I have is this. Uh, because he doesn't listen. That's why, Charlie. I'm standing one foot from the microphone. Um, no, we can't hear you, man. So here's the poster from World Beyond War website. You can all go to it under resources. Post I'm not going to go to anything I can't hear. Jonathan, it has please use the mic. Hold it. They can't hear you in the background on the computer. And the poster on the World Beyond War website lays it out. Uh, we need to stop all military fighting immediately and agree to a peace accord. We need to adopt international law on the Rome Statute and ratify it, joining the International Criminal Court to agree to operate under the ICC's jurisdiction according to international law. We need to allow people who wish to secede from Ukraine their right to declare national sovereignty in the Donbass region, Donetsk and Luhansk. We need to assist refugees who wish to move to another nation state to safely evacuate and relocate and allow other, all other refugees to return to their homes and begin rebuilding communities and infrastructure. We need to agree to release all prisoners of war so that they can return to their countries. We can agree that Ukraine will remain a neutral state. We need to pay environmental and economic reparations for the Nord Stream pipeline attack. We need to agree to abolish NATO and close NATO bases in Europe. 
We need to reallocate resources to programs of human need and at the risk of sounding ridiculous, human sanity. And we have to end all nuclear weapons programs on earth before they end our species. Thank you to our speaker for a great talk. Okay, the next one is Jake. Uh, go ahead, Jake. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can hear you, Jake. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Hold on. We can hear you, Jake. Jake, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, yeah, we we Putin Putin needs to get out of Ukraine entirely. He doesn't belong there. Um, the 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 um, Budapest Accord simply said that they give up the nuclear weapons arsenal at that time. About forty percent of the nuclear weapons arsenal in the world way in Ukraine, they gave them up to Russia in exchange for uh, in exchange for um, uh, security uh, in exchange for security guarantees from the U.S. and, and Great Britain, uh, which we didn't never really fulfilled. If if ironically, I think if Ukraine had kept their nuclear wep weapons in the early 1990s, Putin never would have invaded them. But that much said, that much said, I think that Ukraine's uh, neutrality needs to be um, needs to be respected in its entirety. Uh, they should be able to keep the Donbass and the uh, and Crimea because because after all, they gave up in the, in the early 1990s. They gave up their nuclear weapons, and then we should go back to the bargaining table. And uh, um, oh, the the other thing is, it, Putin cannot be trusted here because of the way he handled the invasion of Crimea in the first place. In uh, in in 2014, when he invaded Crimea, he pretended that he wasn't there. And Obama questioned him about it, and he said, "Oh, they're just little green. They're just little green men." And uh, and Obama said, "But but Vladimir, we can see what's going on." No response. Yeah, so uh, he's he, he's he's acting in bad faith, and then he expects us to negotiate with him. He's not negotiating; he's dictating. He needs to go, and he needs to he needs to uh, go by international law, which respects Ukraine's uh, sovereignty. Uh, Ukraine shouldn't have to give up anything because they already gave up the nuclear weapons to Ukraine, and we need to go back. To the negotiating table and come up with uh, multilateral uh, nuclear arms control. Okay, thank you. Hello? Hello? Well, I hear you, but our screen has changed. Oh. What's, what's changed? What's this again? Uh, it has some sort of a comic guy on it. Oh. Is that Anakin Skywalker? Maybe. I don't know. I guess there we go. We're back. I can't hear anything. I can't hear anything now. What happened? What's going on, Tim? Tim, can you communicate with us? I want to do a rebuttal. Hello? So uh, I think the Zoom people can hear each other, but we can't hear the room. Yeah, that seems to yeah. be the case. Tim, if you can hear us, reassure us as to what's going on. Actually, Charles is probably the liaison for us. Looks well, like I believe he will try trying to restore the connection, and well, I guess all we can do at this point is wait. Okay. Okay. I believe it shouldn't be terribly long. Okay, Charlie. 
there's some issue regarding the signal from that location. Oh. Just kick them. Yes, well, maybe, 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 maybe it's the maybe it's the food. <laughs> maybe it's the food. Maybe, maybe, maybe they took, maybe they put on put too much hot mustard sauce on it and it killed the connection. Well, that doesn't transmit over the Zoom. No, this is rockedly. <laughs> no, there's some some kind of hot some kind of special hot mustard right, sauce. We're which back. Be to kill we're the back. Oh, okay, good. Where Hello? We Where we were. Yo, it's roughly again. No, we're not. Hello? Just wait, Jake, oh. please. There we go. Hello? I think the Zoomers are back, but I don't see the room. Oh, no, actually, the room is there. Is it there? I can't see it. Uh, I can't hear anything. Well, it says live at Dapers or whatever it is, but they have their mic off. I now see a black man, and it says, thank you, N-word. I see that now as well. I don't know who in the hell is doing this, but they keep talking. Give me a minute. There you are. Fuck. What is this? Maybe, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Oh, they're just screen sharing and they're taking things off and I got to disable it all for everybody. This is ridiculous. Tim, what, what, what's, what's going on there? Tell me, tell me for. I've got some help. Tell me Somebody pour hot mustard sauce on the, on, on the electrical co uh, equipment and it gummed up the connection. <laughs> it's got to be the food. Something's wrong with the food there. Have they all died of food poisoning? <laughs> yeah, the, electri the electrical equipment died of food poisoning. Oh, right? okay. oh that's it. Right, uh, right. We got it under control now. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, can, uh, can you see us now and hear us? And then you can also I can now I can now see the room and the mic. Okay. I can't see. Go ahead. Um, go oh, ahead. Now it's gone. It's gone away again. I can't see anything except a green, a white telephone on a green background. I can see you, David. Go ahead. You you want me to you want me to give my rebuttal? Yes. Yeah, let's go. Okay, uh, it was a great talk, but it was very selective. Can you hear me? Yeah, oh, shit. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? We can hear you, and I say let's ignore the screen again. Okay, okay, I'll just talk, and I don't know who can hear me. Uh, it was a great talk. It was very selective. Uh, dis I disagreed with the conclusions. I think the defeat of Ukraine, which is now occurring, will open the gateways to peace in the world. I think that uh, we're overlooking the major fact of reality in this case, and that is Russia has won, Ukraine has lost. I repeat that, Russia has won, Ukraine has lost. Uh, one week ago, Ukrainian started on its offensive, which for, for months they've been talking about, the terror state of, of Kiev has been claiming they were about to launch a spring offensive. Well, it's now past spring, and they've launched that offensive a, a week ago. Uh, and uh, it has suffered a humiliating defeat at the hands of the Russians. Uh, this, this offensive didn't even get through the security zone. You know, there are several layers of Russian defense, which the Russians have been working on. And the outermost is the security zone, which is basically not even claimed to be Russian occupied territory. It's just, uh, it's just uh, an indeterminate area like a no man's land. And the Ukrainians have not even been able to get through the security zone, much less breach any of the later uh, levels of defense. They have lost uh, hundreds of thousands of, well, tens of thousands of men. Uh, they have lost one third of all the military hardware that NATO has given them, uh, and it's not stopping now. 
So the only possible outcome to this is a total victory for Russia. People have to understand this. Uh, talk of laying down conditions to Russia is a lot of nonsense. Russia is going to lay down the conditions on which it will stop fighting. Uh, and those conditions will certainly include the incorporation of all the ethnic Russian parts of Ukraine, which constitute a third of Ukraine's population. All the ethnic Russian parts of Ukraine will uh, attach themselves to the Russian Federation. There's absolutely no getting away from this. It's, it's fated, it's done. Uh, so uh, I happen to believe, I happen to believe that, uh, you, that the US is the aggressor in this conflict. Ukraine doesn't come into I it. They are just puppets of the, of the US. Uh, Zelensky is just a frightened puppy who does exactly what the US uh, ruling class tells him to do. Uh, so uh, Russia is the injured party. Russia wants to defend its, uh, its existence as a nation state. It is doing so very, very successfully. Russia is more prosperous and more solidified morally than it has ever been. Uh, Putin is more popular in Russia than any Russian leader has ever been in history. Uh, the Russian economy is growing despite the war expenses. Uh, and can you believe the stupidity of the US ruling class? They want a war with Russia and a war with China at the same time. Can you believe the stupidity of that? So of course, what has happened is they have driven Russia into a firm alliance with China. Uh, so. All the, all the powerful countries in the world, Russia, China, India, all these countries are now uh, outside the American uh, hegemony. Uh, and you're gonna see all kinds of developments. You're gonna see the collapse of the dollar as a reserve currency. You're gonna see more and more countries throughout the world having nothing to do with the US. Um, and uh, this, you're gonna see the, the, the sudden deterioration of American hegemony. And that's, uh, that's good for peace because the America, the US ruling class is the world's troublemaker. They are the ones who kill tens of thousands of people as in Iraq and as in Libya. They are the ones who stir up these conflicts all over the world. That's gonna stop now because no one has anything but contempt for the US ruling class. Uh, they are finished. Uh, and the sooner they accept this, the better. The more, the more they don't accept it and they persist with this ridiculous notion that Ukraine can win. Ukraine has to worry about surviving as, as an entity, not about winning. They've lost. They have lost. They have lost. Okay, Justin, you're, uh, I'm going to go live next to... Uh, okay, go, go ahead there. Uh, the uh, previous speaker uh, evidently is a Putin apologist and a... Uh, uh, I would suggest if he hates America that much, he should go to Russia. And, and then when he is uh, conscripted into the Russian army and sent to die on the plains of Ukraine in this uh, new offensive, which will win, um, I hope that um, he um, goes to hell. Anyway, if, he, if he's, uh, you know, I, I really do. Uh, that kind of a vicious anti-Americanism, I'm an American, I'm a leftist, unapologetic, but uh, I, I'll be damned if I'll put up with this rhetoric. Um, the United States has made some mistakes, and we all know that they're mostly due to the right wingers uh, and the ruling class, which is a lot of them are evil, yeah. Um, but th that shouldn't make it a reason to hate the entire United States. Um, now, when the United States is correct, as it is um, in defending Ukraine and even if it wasn't for the fact that there is a sacred duty to abide by the Budapest Memorandum, and I'm glad to hear from our speaker that uh, President Clinton has finally acknowledged it at least, he should have been out and about when the uh, troops were amassed at the borders of Ukraine on February uh, 22nd to say, my God, uh, the United States has to really go get in there hard. We really should have probably had troops defending Ukraine at that moment to, uh, to uh, honor this um, obligation that we undertook because Ukraine agreed to um, give up their nuclear weapons that they could have said, well, they're on our territory here. Russia can go and kiss something, you know, kiss the, uh, uh, with our Blarney Stone, <laughs> excuse me, that's the wrong country. But um, they could tell them, they could have told them to go somewhere. We will figure out the codes. We will figure out how to use these nuclear weapons. Uh, we, if necessary, we could take them in trucks 
if you try to decide to invade us later. The Russians signed that and they solemnly agreed never to invade Ukraine. They also exactly. agreed to come to Ukraine's defense if some other party invaded Ukraine. So this is kind of absurd for people to try to uh, get the United States out of its obligation. And um, I do hope that uh, international law and uh, Russian um, aggression, uh, international law is triumphant and um, Russian aggression is defeated. All right, I got, I'm gonna do uh, you next and then Justin, I'll get you right after, uh, oh, right here. I'll, I'll get you right after, uh, Right, right next, and then I know there's one at the 314 number who wants to... Uh, it looks like uh, Sid wants to go as well. well so, yeah, right? Just keep it okay. brief. Okay. Hi, I'm... I'll be back in okay. three minutes. Okay, I'm Ellen Corley, and uh, thank you uh, for your talk. I, I really did appreciate the historical background and the geography, because uh, there's questions that I have that I would have liked to have asked and one, you know, some of the things I've read that I concern me, um, you know, like it sounds like it's kind of a standard, this is history, this is Ukraine, you know, uh, but like some things I did know were about America's Nazi secret in Belarus, the white uh, Russians, the Ukrainian, um, the OU, the you know, the infiltrated Ukrainian part of the Reagan party, you know, the, there's this, Russ Ballant wrote this book, Nazis and the Republican Party. And it's this invisible empire that we have to be aware of, that it, it's what they're hiding. And, you know, if, if they're, you know, Roger Stone mentions or Robert Kennedy, He's called anti-Semitic, you know, because if you say that somebody's a Nazi, they immediately say you're a Nazi. And it's like, no, there's crime, you know, this empire. I, what I saw is, and we, America is an empire and actually the heart of it, and we've got to be open to where is the heart of this empire, is the UK crown, uh, the, the, you know, German families that have the wealth, the, the feudalistic monarchy that funds both sides of the wars through the bankers, through going back 1776, the Rothschild, Rockefeller, you know, the banks, the central banks, the big bank of international settlements, that the Nazi money was brought out. They were sent to Argentina and all those countries that Jonathan showed us to fund both sides, the anti-communist war. There's a battle of fascism against communism. And if we want to do the right thing, we have to stop funding the fascist Nazi invisible empire that's taken over the world. So if, if the world says there really are Azov battalions in the Crimea or in the Ukraine, in the, you know, the, um, Azerbaijan or the Belarus, I believe them. Why don't we try believing them rather than just saying, no, I'm for Ukraine. You know, that is too simple. We've got to look at it like a judge and a jury would look at both sides of the story and say, this is your argument. This is our argument. Let's look at it judicially, right? Let's try to be peace. But we don't. We are we are actually the, this crown, this invisible, you know, cabal of the banks, the billionaires that have corporate taken over the world. They are using us and our treasure and our blood. Actually, we don't have to, we just send the arms. We send 35, 40% of our money, our you know, to, they, and they don't pay taxes. You know, we pay taxes. The little people pay taxes, not the real estate, not the not the globalist, they don't have to, they, their corporate office is in Switzerland or, you know, the banks or they, they have hedge funds. They, the tax write-offs of the Manhattan Institute, the Federalist Society, the 501c3s, you know, they're, they don't pay taxes. 
And yet we have, you know, Doug who has to, you know, say, yeah, I want to give all my tax money to Ukraine to save them. I mean, it's, you're just getting fooled, you know, and, and we're all getting fooled. That's it. They're deceiving us. That's the problem. Okay. All right, who's Justin, you're next. Hey, Justin, what's your name? Justin, you have your hand up your neck, otherwise I'm going to skip you. Okay, Ernie, go ahead. We, we did hear from Justin. Go ahead, Ernie. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Ernie. All right. I've got a bunch of things to say here. First of all, uh, as far as the things that have been going on at the College of Complexes, both verbally and, and in the chat, uh, I, I disagree with a lot of it, agree with some of it, but to me, the College of to, to me, the College of Complexes, all views should be heard. All views, even one we don't like, uh, we, uh, okay, don't count that time against me, please, Tim. Uh, okay, we 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 should we should uh, we should listen to all of these people, uh, but we should take it with a grain of salt. I I definitely very strongly favor the Ukrainian position in this case. I asked the question: If we don't stop Russia now, where do we stop them? And we have told the Russians indirectly: We aren't going to stop you. We'll throw some money at this problem, but we're not going to throw. We'll throw some treasure, but not not any blood. And and eventually they'll be on your own. Uh, countries and groups should realize by now that Americans are not dependable allies. There are so many cases in the past uh, with the Kurds with the Iraqis who were going to overthrow Saddam and various large, we can, we can make a long list of the groups that America said, oh yeah, we're behind you. And whoops, where were we when the, when the uh, shit hit the fan? We weren't anywhere nearby. So in that sense, uh, the Ukrainians have to be ready for the worst. I, I, I am of the opinion that there's no clear, uh, case, or no clear, uh, uh, end to this war, and it's not clear who's going to win and what they're going to win. I don't think the Russians will ever get all of Ukraine, but we may, we may, the rest of the world may decide we're going to do something like we was happened before World War II uh, regarding Czechoslovakia. Well, okay, we'll give them, a, we'll give them this part. If you'll agree that the Russians get this part, then the war will be over and we'll protect you. And then, of course, after that agreement, several months after that, Hitler just went in and took over the rest of Czechoslovakia. So, and, and, and again, it was the, the very undependable Westerners, especially the Americans uh, that let that happen. And we cannot let that happen here. I'm ashamed. We should have substantial amounts of military troops in there, uh, which of course we can't spare. We don't, have, we don't have a ground military anymore to speak of. We have nuclear weapons all over the place, but we don't have a ground, a ground army. And we should be giving the, the Ukrainians what they need uh, uh, to repel the Russians, including weapons which attack the sources inside Russia that are attacking Ukraine. Okay, we should be attacking the air bases in Russia that are sending planes and missiles into Ukraine. And the, as far as a danger, well, yes, I think we're in World War III. When you have three of the, uh, several of the major world powers directly or indirectly uh, fighting each other this way, it is a world war. It's not a nuclear conflagration over the entire world, which hopefully we, we could avoid. But uh, it, is, it is a world war. And I, I don't think that even crazy Putin would uh, risk the destruction of his beloved Russia, total destruction, of his his, his 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 rush time's up ernie i'm sorry i can't hear what you're saying tim okay but anyway i i concluded shut up a second let me finish okay i i basically i finished uh i do we just muted you because we got more to go justin you're next justin you hear me now can you hear me 
Can, I, can you guys hear me? Justin, okay, go ahead. I'll get you next. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, if you keep saying, if you repeatedly saying my name, isn't going to make me, uh, you know, talk faster. Anyways, <clears throat> so um, I'm not sure uh, who is to, you know, what, what the whole, I tried to listen to this presentation, but it kept getting interrupted by trolls and mentally I'm also a little distracted at work, but um I certainly do not like war. I don't like killing people. Um, the United States certainly doesn't have any business in this, but um, the whole thought of, of the situation or just just the you know apparent sort of ugly turn the world has gone has filled me with great despair. Now, regarding the trolls, there are means at which we can control the trolls and there's administrative features within Zoom to cut back on it. I've repeatedly asked him to turn them on, and he hasn't done it. Um, and it gets a little disruptive, and it gets a little irritating. And, um, you know, I don't know what else to do. It's it's it's, well, it's really Justin, obnoxious. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to learn about them. All right. There, uh, so. then, there's, and then also people like to uh, interrupt people during their oh, rebuttal. Just not taking, uh, when it's one full at a time. One full at a time. One full at a time. So um, not only do the trolls get obnoxious, but the uh, rule breaking, the, you know, I don't, this guy kind of went on, I think, longer than an hour. Um. You know, there just seems to be a breakdown of the format, breakdown of rule breaking, and and lack of enforcement for trolls. Thank you. All right, we got it. All right, Charlie, you're yeah. next. All right, six next, and then we'll go to Give me the mic for Sid. Give me a mic for Sid. You got three minutes, Sid, or two, actually. We're trying, starting to run out of time here with the amount of people wanting to speak. Go ahead. Okay, the United States is the biggest empire that ever existed. If you look at Latin America, we got the Monroe Doctrine. We supported every dictator in Latin America. Through the Valle in Haiti, Batista in Cuba, Puntas all over Latin America, and we supported them. Why? Because we make super profits. The corporations, they go in there, make super profits, and they get much wealthier. If you look at Europe, we supported the Honda in Greece. We supported different dictators like Franco in Spain, all over the place. Why? Because when they go to war, we make tremendous profits. What happens in war, everything gets destroyed and we have to build. So the factories are building, building, and building. Okay. If somebody buys a car, it only lasts maybe 10 years. But in war, we make billions. All right, we're here. All right, Dave, just pass the mics on. Charlie, we're going to get you in about one or two more rebutters. So just sit tight. Okay, Dave, go ahead and use the microphone. Okay, I would like to associate myself with every word that Doug said. What the Russians are doing is no different from what they did under the czars. This is the same kind of Russian imperialism that Russia has been practicing for centuries. And if you require proof, look what happened when, when um, what now is the Ukrainian Orthodox Church separated from the Russian Orthodox Church. The Russian Orthodox Church was very angry and they broke with the rest of the Eastern Orthodox movement because they dared to recognize the Ukrainian Orthodox Church as a separate national Orthodox Church. 
And what the Russians are doing is no different what the Nazis did when they marched into Poland, plain and simple. And same with all their bombing of Kiev and all the other Ukrainian cities. It's no different when they bombed when the Nazis bombed Warsaw. So I have no I have no sympathy for the Russians whatsoever. And the United States is quite right to back the Ukrainians in the in their drive to keep their independence as a national state. Period. End of story. I'd like to thank our speaker for tonight for a good talk. I'd like to uh, mention um, next week I'm giving a talk on censored news, but it's going to censor around something that was just touched upon lightly here. My, the title of my talk will be The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. That's the problem we have with billionaire predators who are running big agribusiness, big oil, big military and big pharma. And those the billionaire predators, as Sid talked about, you make 10% profit per ton on steel in peacetime. You make 200% profit, 300% profit on that same ton of steel in wartime. That's why Dick Cheney said, we gotta have a permanent war economy from now on. Martin Luther King said, you spend more money on machinery to kill people than on living conditions. The country is headed towards spiritual, moral, and actual death so there's we're going to be talking about problems and solutions next week for those of you that want to uh, read up a little bit there's a book called the climate book that greta thunberg edited it's not just about the climate it's about all kinds of things happening all over the world basically that are caused by the billionaire predators that no amount of money is ever ever no amount of profit is ever enough and if we don't address those issues, then the human race is headed toward pretty much extinction in the next 70 to 80 years. Uh, who knows if, if a tenth, tenth of us, 10% of the planet will survive for humans. So that, and uh, we're going to be talking about that next week. The last thing I would say to all of those of you that may be looking on Zoom or out there in uh, Zoom land, uh, this presentation I'm going to be giving next week will have visuals. We're going to give away printed material. We're going to give away some books. Uh, I would highly recommend everybody that can attend in person next week. And then we, hopefully we won't have uh, the kind of hack situation that we had tonight. Thank you all. And thank the speaker again for a really good talk. We're going to get our next last guy in the, in the, in the thing. Uh, and then we're going to go to Charlie. Um, Great, uh, great, great lecture. Um, you know, uh, I keep hearing that it's NATO expansion caused this. NATO expansion caused Putin to invade a country that is not a NATO member. Um, we seem to forget, why would a nation like Poland, for example, want it, want to join NATO in the first place? Well, um, 3 million ethnic Poles were butchered by the Soviets, while 2.5 million were butchered by the Nazis. The Russians had a, a half a million on the Nazis. We seem to forget that. And uh, one of my, my uh, ancestors was sent off to the Siberian Gulag. Um, so I, 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 don't, uh, I don't think much of Russia right now, what they're doing. What they're doing is the same thing that did there. World War II was not a victory. It was a half victory. It was only a victory against Germany. But Eastern Europe remained under the Iron Curtain until 1993. And uh, yeah. Um, but nobody brings up the, what happened to Lithuania, what happened to Estonia, what happened to the Latvia. Who, who invaded those countries? Soviet Russia invaded them. Who invaded Finland during World War II? Soviet Russia invaded Finland. Now, why, why would you think Finland would want to join NATO now? I mean, mm, that's a, that's a, a head scratcher, huh? Can't figure it out. Hey, you know, if NATO is the excuse, then maybe um, um, Putin should hurry up and invade Sweden, Sweden right? Right? Sweden, Sweden hasn't joined yet, you know? So maybe he's got a few more months to go. He can invade Sweden. Because uh, he, he missed his chance on invading Finland, right? Because Finland was a little too fast on joining. So, so yeah. So um, anybody that says that uh, NATO expansion is the reason why Putin invaded a country that is not a member of NATO is really um, uh, excused of critical thinking. Next. Okay. Uh, actually, now we're going to have to go to Charlie because he's got his hand Charlie, go ahead. All right. Quiet, please. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our speaker, Henry. Thank you very much for a 
a great presentation. I apologize for any interference there may have been. Um, and I would recommend anybody, the links are still up on our website, links to the articles he wrote and recommended. And I would recommend uh, uh, taking a look at those and, and looking them over. And I would like to have you back again, Henry, sometime. By the way, you don't need that PowerPoint. You can, your, your speech is interesting in and of itself. I'll be eclectic as usual, just a few points. I address uh, one thing I don't think people realize is that this, uh, the Ukraine is not the only territorial demand presently outstanding by Russia and Putin. Uh, he seems to have gotten Crimea by sending in troops that are out of uniform and nefarious activities. Uh, he also has outstanding territorial demands on three portions of Georgia and a few other locations. I'm not able to pronounce the names of these locations. However, this is only the beginning of perhaps a restoration of the empire. Um, is, is that an appropriate use of a military? Um, well, you tell me what other reason there could be uh, to bring an end to an aggressor nation that is exercising a territorial imperative and engaged in a process of colonization. Uh, few people, I think, those of us of Eastern European heritage are fully aware of the people known as Bolsheviks, who unfortunately gained control uh, in Russia subsequent to the revolution and still have maintain a presence there. These are not uh, noted as uh, kindly civilian administrators. Um, and it's been alluded to, they were rather, practiced rather harsh treatment of captive nations, which on the first opportunity sought to extract themselves from that administration. That alone is the historical lesson we can learn. Not only did they remove themselves uh, at the first opportunity from rule by Russia, but they thought about means of precluding it from ever happening again, at least to themselves. That's the definitive fact of the situation, which cannot be disputed. Those are deliberate actions taken by these nations. Um, and last of all, I would like to say, we do follow a format at the college. And I must concur with Mr. Sucker, that if you fail to comply with the rules of the college, I'm recommending that you be zapped off the Zoom or not pre or precluded not from speaking. Now, I saw somebody there. We asked the speaker to please use the microphone. And for one reason, I don't know, he disregarded it. And even that's, that's discourteous to the other people in attendance. Now, there, if you have no right, free speech does not entail you to be discourteous. And we saw any number of interruptions. And the chair is going to be asked if you are going to continue in any fashion. There will be no opportunity, no opportunity to improve. You will be asked to leave that meeting because you're making. Listen, Tim, I'm telling you that. You, if, if you do not follow the rules, you will be disclosed. You can come back next week. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, take it away. All right. Is that 30 seconds? All right. Yeah, just go ahead and get 30 seconds handed off to our speaker. So I know I, I appreciate our speaker. I appreciate a history lesson because that can you know, give us a perspective. It's not, you know, based in any current, current political bias. Um, so I could, I could expend this time and energy you know, explaining how I understand the Russian viewpoint or how I understand the Ukrainian viewpoint, but there's something that stops me 
from taking either side. And it's not Charlie, it's not the trolls in the chat, it's not my own views, it's this thing called the Atlantic Ocean. See, Sid pointed out something, and it's it, the Monroe Doctrine was really bad because it allowed America to terrorize Latin America. But the one good thing about it is, theoretically, it kept us from messing around in countries that are so far away that we're wasting gas and polluting like crazy just to get there and conduct wars and have all these military bases overseas. So I'm not going to, you know, you don't have to love the American government. It's done plenty of things wrong, but you're, you're Americans. And I, I don't like seeing my neighbors shamed over whether they would like to serve in the Ukrainian or Russian army. Okay. Thank you very much. I thank you everyone for the, you know, the responses. Those who agree with me, so this is no problem. There were a few critical voices. And uh, I would like to mention two things. One thing that, uh, like David, for example, was very saying, hi, David, I didn't meet you for a while. Uh, uh, like David was saying that uh, for practical reason, Russia is winning. I don't know if they're winning, but uh, he brought the valid point that Russia still is very powerful and they have a chance to have some military advances in that uh, war. And the question is, what well, some people say, well, we have to be realistic. We have to stop and get peace at any price. And this brings, and I wrote the article about it. So you, those people who are interested can look at that. This brings Monachium 38 to, to our memory, where basically they say, yeah, we have to be realistic. You know, we deal with that guy, he is dangerous just please him and and, and uh, things will go away and unfortunately you know we know what's happened so simply any not decisive solution today is just kicking the problem down the road the other thing which i would like to mention is that many people uh, mentioned that you know we are spending our money over the this is you know the war i don't i think you said it, that the war is I sorry, I forgot your name. Uh, uh, that the war is basically the way of making money for uh, billionaires, and few people mentioned that as well. And uh, I think that we're talking about deep. I'm talking deep misinformation of American public about exactly who rules America. You don't rule. The president doesn't rule. Your congressman doesn't rule. The money, what you said, from somewhere from Geneva, Zurich and also from Wall Street, they rule the America. And unfortunately, there is no uh, talking about the, uh, the censorship, which you'll be talking next week. There is no literature about the subject. The best book, which I found out, was written, it is five books written by Song Hong Bing, the Chinese fellow uh, who wrote in Mandarin, and they were not translated into English the first book for about 10 years, the last book for about five years, because simply they were dangerous. And uh, I found out that they are translated to English just about two years ago. Song Hong Bing, currency wars, go to Amazon, spend $125, uh, 2,000 of reading, pages of reading, you'll be smart. Thank you, Henrik, for Henrik, for a wonderful talk. I hope you come back. Next week, Andy Anderson is going to talk about what is it, the blacked out stories of twenty of twenty twenty-three. Look promises to be an interesting talk. I plan to be here. I hope you do too. Thank you. The what stories of twenty twenty-three? Uh, current current blacked out stories, but we'll have a, a, a flyer with a top 10. There's two bad to be true, 10, five that are too bad to be true, and five that are too good to be true. And you can take okay. that flyer with you anywhere and test it to see if you're in a brain dead zone. If you can't get into an instant food fight over one of these 10, everybody says, well, that should be on the news. That can't be true. Or that'll be on the news. We'll give you. We'll give away flyers, and we're gonna give away a dozen books next week too. Why does Andy Thank get you. two uh, rebuttals? Well, the thing is, we're trying to shut down. Now, go ahead and shut us down. I want to say one thing.
Putin is not his real name. His real name is Rex. Can't hear you. We're adjourned. Good night, everyone. Good night.